The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Welcome to this bonus episode of Star Wars Ologies, the podcast about science and other academic fields of study seen in Star Wars. This bonus episode, however, has nothing to do with Star Wars. Instead, it's the recording of our panel at LA Comic Con about the anniversary of Galaxy Quest, one of the greatest movies of all time. We had a crew member who worked on the movie, as well as some fans that have done creative work inspired by Galaxy Quest. It was a great panel. We had a great time. And thank you all for listening. And make sure to check out our YouTube channel where we share this episode along with all of the slides that we shared in the room. Welcome everybody to a Galaxy Quest 25th anniversary celebration. I don't know if I'm the only one who realized 25 years since the greatest movie maybe yes. ever made. <laughs> um, I'm going to have our panelists uh, introduce themselves as we go down the line here real quick. Uh, I myself am Melissa Miller. I'm a science writer based in San Diego and just a big sci-fi fan. I used to write science articles for Nerdist uh, and I write for Star Wars Insider Magazine. Um, so I'm going to have you guys introduce yourself, your connection to Galaxy Quest, um, and then your favorite quote from the movie. Mine as a scientist is definitely Guy being like, don't open that. You don't know if there's air. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, now every time I watch any sci-fi episode ever, that gets quoted in my house. Yeah. So we'll start with you, Bob. Um, my name is Fawn Davis. I uh, work in motion pictures. I run Fonco Studios here in L.A. Um, uh, on Galaxy Quest, I worked in the ILM model shop uh, 25 years ago. It's hard to believe. Actually, I guess it would be 27 years ago because movies take a long time to make. Um, my favorite line from Galaxy Quest would be... Um, by Raptar's hammer. <laughs> oh, what a savings. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Erin McDonald. I have a PhD in astrophysics. I work as a science advisor in the industry. I have no professional association to Galaxy Quest other than the fact that I am Star Trek's official science advisor, and we all know Galaxy Quest is the best Star Trek film ever made, so... <laughs> <laughs> It is my favorite movie of all time. I have the NSCA protector next to the Voyager tattoo on my arm. Um, I asked, so when you asked, like, what's your favorite quote, uh, I immediately knew, but I had to ask my husband, like, what do you think my answer is? Or what's the one I use the most? Because by Grabthar's hammer is great. Um, to see if there's a pub, I quote quite often. But he went right back to me, and as a scientist, might as well as, is there air? You don't know? <laughs> so, that one wins the prize. And he guessed it. So, yeah, I was pretty proud of that one. Awesome. Uh, my name is Jack Bennett, and I am but a sucker fish on the blue whale that is Galaxy Quest. <laughs> I spent three and a half years directing and producing a documentary that was released as Never Surrender, a Galaxy Quest documentary. And I conducted all of the interviews with all the people from Galaxy Quest. And my favorite line is, uh, you know, it's hard to pick because you watch the movie and it becomes, well, that's my favorite line. Oh, wait, no, that's my favorite line. That's my favorite scene. That's my favorite moment. And it just continues throughout the entire movie. But pressed, if I had to pick just one, and it exploded. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I figured we had to start uh, this conversation off a little bit meta, right? This was before I went to a fan convention, I saw Galaxy Quest, and this was my idea of a fan convention. So I'm curious, for our panelists here, um, how does Galaxy Quest Convention 18 compare to your experience at conventions? I feel like it's pretty accurate. I, it was interesting, though. When this came out, I feel like conventions weren't like that. I remember seeing shows that showed conventions like this. I was like, not that many people cosplay. And then, of course, within uh, not a, a long time, uh, that many people cosplay. So they kind of looked into the future for this. Uh, we got to build a miniature version of this convention, by the way, with all the merch and little buttons and all kinds of stuff. And then we crashed a spaceship into it. Nice. Perfect. I feel like it's, it's based more on the Star Trek conventions at the time. The movie was made in 98, 99, and uh, I look at uh, 
you know, QuestCon, I look at it in the movie and I think, oh, that looks like the parking would be a lot better than any Comic-Con I've been to. <laughs> but um, it does still feel like when you go to conventions that are more regional, it feels like that convention still exists. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's a lot of people there. It's a healthy audience, but it doesn't have that, you know, you go to San Diego Comic-Con and you can't move. There are so many people. Right. Um, when we went to San Jose Comic-Con, we went to Silicon Valley Comic-Con, that felt more like the mm -hmm. quest con in the movie so I, I feel like that convention still exists for sure and i yeah i mean this is obviously i do a ton of star trek conventions and this is this is very reminiscent to that i think the two kind of favorite moments for me that stand out is when jason nesbeth goes to the bathroom and there's like the two aliens like at the urinals like talking to each other like yeah that that is a convention <laughs> you all which understand. is based on real life that's based on shatner being in the in the restroom that absolutely was taken from life shatner heard people talking about him while I was in the bathroom. Was, uh, <laughs> were they dressed as Klingons? Oh, I hope they were. I don't yeah. think he tried to look. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And then, of course, being the science advisor, too, I, I sit at tables and get people, you know, coming up and say, well, in this episode, you know, the nacelles did this, and then they said that they were going to warp 10, and like, we just want to know where the, where the inner lies in that. <laughs> so that's constantly answering very detailed technical questions of Star Trek, yeah, specs. That's, that's my job. <laughs> Uh, autographs are not fifteen dollars anymore, though. Oh uh, <laughs> nor, nor will Sigourney Weaver dress up as one of her characters and pose as most likely. But uh, we can all dream. She will, but it'll be with a stack of boxes in between you and and her. Right. We can right. take the picture right. with her. That's true. Right. You're like, is there someone there? Okay. Right. For two hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah. So. No. Uh, a day, days gone by. No. Well, Fawn, I think we should just get directly into the fun projects that you got to work on. Um, can you t what can you tell us about the design of the ships, um, and what other models did you work on? Uh, we worked on the, uh, I was on the team for the whole visual effects part in the miniature unit, which was in Northern California. We did this uh, protector, which is eight feet long. Uh, we did uh, about a nine foot long Ceres ship, which is the bad guy's ship. We also did a three foot protector and um, a six-foot shuttle, which is the part that comes off of the protector. And then we did a really, really huge nose of a shuttle that we crashed through the 1-6 scale uh, convention center. So it was, it was a lot of stuff. It was a lot of, a lot of months of hard work. The protector in particular was a really challenging ship because you see those wings that come off, and they go a very long distance before they reach their end. And we had to build a gimbal into the framework so that mm. if there was any kind of sagging, we could get the wings to go uh, tilt up sideways, but also tilt up and down backwards. Because when it was on the rig, depending on how it was sitting, the wings would actually move. So Because they were cantilevered out so far. So those are the design things that people think of when they draw a picture and then you try to make it in reality. You're like, wow, that's going to be it, way it, harder than it sounds. Isn't it amazing how much practical goes into digital effects? <laughs> like, they're so, yeah. like, And I always say this about the movie. It's the same effects pedigree as Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. Everybody always holds up Jurassic Park as the perfect marriage of digital and practical effects. And it's Stan Winston and ILM. Yeah. It's, it's the exact same pedigree. Yeah, I feel like there was, a, there was an era there where hybrid... Uh, visual effects were really prime and those are the movies that still hold up today like when you look at the visual effects of Galaxy Quest they really still hold up it, it, even though there are a lot of movies that came out after that don't hold up because can, of the CG 100% can you confirm what Bill George told me about the protector that says NT protector on it the it's three. an NTE protector, yeah, because yeah, it stands for... Not the Enterprise. So <laughs> yeah. Legally, yeah. legally, they could Just stand in a court of law. Yeah. And, and the original name of the ship was actually the STD protector. <laughs> <laughs> they decided against that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the purpose of different size models? Because here we see one that you know is much smaller versus the, the larger uh, one. So what, how do those get used differently? So, so this is the one you're looking at is actually the one that we make first. So we always do a really, really tiny version of the model, uh, just kind of work out all the details, the proportions, things like is it going to fall apart, <laughs> stuff like that. So you learn a lot from just doing a mock-up, and then you also get uh, something that informs the teams that are making the much bigger, more expensive model before you commit to that. Um, this one's the three-footer, and the three-footer we actually made to be the television show version from the 1960s, oh, nice. and then we had the eight-foot version that was supposed to be the, the actual protector that the Thermians created, and that's the, the, yeah, the eight-footer. Funny thing was, we try to really 
we tried really, really hard to make the three-footer look like it was kind of cheesy or more toy-like. And uh, it ended up, when we first started shooting it, you couldn't tell that it was, it was bad. It looked too good. <laughs> so we had to find ways to make it look even more toy-like. It was really actually a weird challenge for us to try to make it look bad. Yeah. But it was really, really actually harder to make that one look bad than the, the big one to look good. <laughs> Well, the design of Sarah's ship is something that I didn't really even notice until seeing your pictures. There's one of these pictures here where it looks like it's got googly eyes on it. And I was just think maybe it was never shot from this particular angle. Yes, yeah, never shot that way. And then if you go back to the, the painting of it in the black light room, so when you see the protector get ready to do anything aggressive, there's these lights that come out from behind all the scales that kind of rev up. That was all done with UV paint. So we actually had to paint those details in with UV paint with an airbrush. And then on stage, they would ramp up or down the black level of black light on the ship to really give it that kind of feeling of being alive. That was the thing that really drove the design of this ship that was different than probably any other spaceship I've ever worked on is the fact that it looked like it was, it looked like it was grown instead of constructed. It, it has very that organic. undersea quality. Yes. They, everything is very crustaceans in there. It's hanging in ILM, and they put a little UV light in it so that it glows when you oh, walk when you I look inside that. it. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. 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 yeah that one and the protector are both hanging in the stairway yeah. at yeah. ILM. That's awesome. Well, and something I didn't notice until seeing your documentary, uh, Jack, and they, them pointing out was, you know, I'm an overthinker, but <laughs> I had never noticed this where it's coming out of the space dock. Yeah. You know, yeah. scratching yep. uh, on the side. But that's like the nose cone that's scratching. If yeah. you look at the design here, there's literally no way that's possible, but who cares? That seems and, so funny. <laughs> and who is the person who points out that that couldn't possibly work scientifically? Tim Allen. Uh, <laughs> no, it doesn't quite... It, 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 shut up, Tim. No, no, but... <laughs> yeah, when we, when we were working on that scene, we had to take the left wing off. Yeah. Okay. So we can, we can get the nose yep. in. <laughs> right, but I mean, I've seen it dozens of times and never noticed it until until See, the document. I had canoned it that they were so swiveled over that oh, like it was just wildly impossible. But yeah, that's just how I right. yeah, watch it without. Works. Yeah, it's fine. That's a tech advisor. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were actually hoping no one would notice. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many times we cheat and no one notices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Fair enough. It just once you watch a movie twenty five plus times, then you start to pick up on those things. Yeah. So. And that scene is so funny. Yeah. Why would you want to poke holes in that? Exactly. Yeah. No, even if that had been like a note in the process, like, but it's okay, leave it in there. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, Well, Aaron and Jack, I'm curious uh, if either of you saw the movie right from the beginning when it first came out, what your impression of it was, if you knew somehow it would be going into your creative work. Yeah, I, I saw it in theaters. Um, I was a huge Alan Rickman fan. Um, I still am. I have another I would quote of Alan Rickman tattooed on my arm. R.I.P. Love the man. And um, yeah, so like that was that was kind of my draw because I actually wasn't into Star Trek. I was into sci-fi, but I didn't grow up in a sci-fi household, and so I wasn't familiar with like Trekkies or Star Trek or anything like that. But but I loved Alan Rickman, so that was my <laughs> impetus for going. And yeah, I mean, fell in love. It, it genuinely became my favorite movie of all time. And then it's like the Star Trek stuff came after, and that only just grew my love for the film. And it is one of those things that you go back and watch it, and you're like, just this is just a really, really good movie. And, you know, we had gone to the U.K. a bunch growing up, too, so I think that line when Alan Rickman just said, like, to see if there's a pub. Uh, it's just <laughs> such, such, such an iconic. And then, yeah, I mean, really, I, I remember, well, Galaxy Quest was actually the first DVD I ever bought. <laughs> so that was fun. And then, yeah, when I when I did start getting into Star Trek fandom and going to conventions, it was like that warmth and happiness of, like, Really, you know, I was so worried that Star Trek fans would be so well, actually, and it's not. I think the that's and then going back to watch Galaxy Quest, you feel that love for fandom and for science fiction, and just like it is made like to laugh with us, not at us. And I think that's the heart of gold that the film carries on, which is my approach to life too. And it's what makes it ahead of its time too. Mm -hmm. Is that it's it takes the goofy fan characters, it takes the sweaty Comic-Con characters, <laughs> and in the beginning it, it shows them accurately as a bunch of nerds, and because of their nerdiness, they save the world. I mean, because of those fans' knowledge of the mechanics of the spaceship, they're able to save the world. That, that was actually something that had changed partway into the production. Too. Sure, yeah. Uh, originally, they were going to make fun of fans as part of the story, and then at a certain point, everyone kind of looked at it and said, no, that's not the spirit of this movie. 
the movie should be celebrating fans, not taking jabs at them. So they really kind of rewrote it to make sure yeah. that they weren't making fun of fans and fans could be the heroes. I, th I think Bob Gordon, who wrote the movie, always had that fan love. But as I recall, when Harold Ramis was going to direct it, it was a lot more acerbic and it was a lot more scathing. And then it was sort of Dean and Bob, Dean Pariso, who then directed it, and then and then Bob is the writer, who brought that to the forefront, that, that genuine joy and, and love for fandom. And what's hilarious, I just mentioned Harold Ramis, I heard about Galaxy Quest, of all things, from an article on Ain't It Cool News back in, like, yeah, the, the <laughs> fall of, yeah, I know, of 1998. And uh, it said, Harold Ramis directing sci-fi comedy for DreamWorks. And it's just like, oh, yeah, cool, great. And then three months later, and they cast Tim Allen, and Harold Ramis left, and I'm not going to see this movie now. I was like, oh, all right. And I forgot all about it. Christmas 1999, those, the ads were on TV. It looked funny. I wasn't the biggest Tim Allen fan, but I was, I was the biggest Sigourney Weaver and Alan Rickman fan. At that point, I'd seen Tony Shalhoub and Big Night. I'd seen <laughs> Sam Rockwell and a bunch of indie movies. And I was like, yeah, it looks funny. And when you're home from college and in your, uh, your house with your family, uh, you need to get out. <laughs> so my best friend from high school and I went to the movies and said, yeah, let's go see, yeah, whatever, yeah. And we go see it, and it was one of those movies. You know how sometimes you watch a movie, and you're like, afterwards, was, was that really good? That was, like, <laughs> really good, right? <laughs> like, that wasn't just good. That was really good. <laughs> and then I asked all my friends when I got back to school, like, hey, did you see Galaxy Quest? And they're like, what is that? That summer, I was working at a video store, and it came out on DVD, and I rented that thing every weekend. <laughs> and the reason was because... I would get calls from my friends saying, what was that movie that we watched last weekend? Can you, can you get it again? And it just, it became like this thing that got passed around. I must have rented that movie 200 times in the summer of, summer of 2000. Yeah. And uh, as I told this story to Dean and Bob when we were interviewing them for the documentary, you watch Bob's smile growing and growing and Dean's scared expression. Like, it's, you, you've seen our movie 200 times <laughs> and the fear on Dean's face I feel like that represents their two personalities you know, perfectly, so. No, I mean, I have to, since we talked about Tim Allen a little bit, I'd like to skip ahead to sort of that question where um, it really seemed, I didn't realize the controversy behind it, but in, in the documentary you uh, talk about all the other people who were maybe cast um, and so if you have some insights into, into those, I love the way you dress them up. I <laughs> love this graphic. The, the reason I love this graphic, the Tim Robbins one I didn't do. That was somebody in post-production at Defy Media. And then a different, but it looks fantastic, and I love that one. And then, um, so I made these two graphics of Bruce Willis and, and Mel Gibson myself with Photoshop. And what I did was I went to 1999 Mel Gibson and 1999 Bruce Willis. So that's from The Sixth Sense, and that's from Payback. <laughs> and then that's in 1999 Alec Baldwin, too. It's like you got to remember where these guys were in their careers. Right. Alec Baldwin was who Harold Ramis wanted to cast after Kevin Kline turned it down. Mm -hmm. So that's what it was. It was a Kevin Kline movie all during pre-production. And Kevin Kline, who is one of my all-time favorite actors, you know, Fish Called Wanda, he's an amazing, amazing, hilarious actor. He has a nickname in Hollywood, which is Kevin DeCline. <laughs> oh. And we got Charles Newworth saying that on, on, he's like, that's right, he de-Kevin Klined. So <laughs> Kevin was courted and courted and courted, and then he turned it down, and Harold Ramis said, well, I want Alec Baldwin to play it. But before it got to that point, the list begins with every comedian in Hollywood. The first name on that list of who can we cast as, as Jason is um, Robin Williams. So imagine that movie starring Robin Williams in the Tim, Tim Allen role. And uh, conversely, Bicentennial Man came out around that same time, and that was going to be a Tim Allen movie at some point. Hmm. These guys just kind of shuffle around until the right person winds up in the right part. But it's literally a list of who can open a movie. So it's Robin Williams first, Tom Hanks is in there, Tom Hanks is actually good casting for that part, I think. Um, Steve Martin turned it down. You know, everybody turned it down. The guys that Harold really wanted are on that board. It's Kevin Kline, Tim Robbins, Mel Gibson he talked to, Bruce Willis, and then Alec Baldwin while well, the other guys turned it down. And the problem with all of those casting choices is you take out the underdog factor that you have when you cast Tim Allen. We all knew Tim Allen from Home Improvement. We knew him from the Santa Claus. We knew all that stuff. 
you know, Toy Story had come out, but you don't really associate that with like a Tim Allen movie. Oh, that's true. He'd already been to space. Yeah. That's right. He'd already been to space. <laughs> and the thing, and the thing that I really love about it is that when you watch Galaxy Quest the first time, Tim mm-hmm. Allen proves himself as an actor <laughs> in the scene that the character is at his absolute lowest when he has to confess, "I'm a liar. I'm a fraud. I'm a charlatan." And you're like, Tim Allen's really good. Wasn't that was a story in the documentary? That's right. right? Yeah, yeah. I love this story. Oh my god. Yeah. All right. Uh, you guys. You got it. It's so good. The <laughs> um, the, uh, but the thing is that Tim Allen, as a person who is unproven as a movie star, who is more of a TV actor, becomes the character in a way that these other guys would have been movie stars playing a has been TV actor, mm. and that I think is the big. The, the reason why it's such genius cast, it's his best performance, and he says that too. And he's he's not just like, oh, that's his best. He's great in yeah. the movie. Yeah. And then I fed this line to Paul Shear in the documentary, and I'm so glad he said it on camera. <laughs> if you squint at him, he looks like Shatner from the 60s. <laughs> 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 that, that kinda... anyway, Paul well, liked that line. So shirt, just the right, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's actually a fascinating thing too, um, if you'll allow me to go on for a second. There's this whole thing that happens with movies, and I really wanted the documentary to reflect this, and I, I think the version that came out kind of does, but there's, there's a director's cut that really reflects this, which is that all of the choices that went into the movie, there's a combination of deliberate and accidental, and then there are the th- these things that affect everybody's lives that you couldn't have predicted. So Harold Ramis was going to direct it, and he wanted to cast Kevin Klein or Alec Baldwin. Then he leaves the movie and Tim Allen is, is cast. And the thing is, if Tim Allen hadn't been cast in that movie and they hadn't said, now you've got to look like a, uh, you know, a, a movie star, a buff, or uh, you've got to look like Shatner back in the day, you've got to look like an action hero, then he wouldn't have had a personal trainer. Mm-hmm. And when he got cast in the movie, his life was a little iffy at that time. Because he had just gotten divorced, you know, there all this stuff. His his life was a bit of a mess. I don't think he would, you know, mind me saying that. And his personal trainer who got him into shape is his wife to this day. <laughs> so if all of that stuff hadn't happened, yeah. he might not have met her and got his life together and you know had the had the life he's had since. Yeah, so. Awesome. Wow. Okay. so right. <laughs> <laughs> you had Tim Allen stories too, right? Oh yeah, well we were we were well into the production of the way the movies are made then, uh, mostly now, <laughs> unless it's virtual production. You always shoot principal photo- photography first, and then you do all the visual effects. So the movie was already shot, and we were well into the visual effects for the movie, and we got word that Tim Allen was recutting the entire movie <laughs> to make it less uh, adult. Because right. the, the original humor for the movie was very uh, filled with a lot of F-bombs and just swearing and all these kinds of things. And so he, he decided it should be a family movie, and it was a really, really good choice when you watch the movie. You really yeah. feel like it would have been much worse if they had a bunch of unnecessary swearing and adult humor. Uh, so all that was cut, and the only scene that they were not able to cut from the movie <laughs> is when you see, well, they cut the, the audio, but <laughs> when, when Sigourney Weaver sees the chomper, if you watch carefully, she mouths uh, a very different word than screw that. <laughs> different phrase. Um, but aside from that, that, that was something that happened very late in the process. It was a really good decision. We the whole movie came everywhere. together. Yeah. We, it looked, like- we looked everywhere for that audio. I was, I was in Dean's attic with him, just going through old tapes, trying to see if we could find a rough cut with, with that audio in it. And finally, Sigourney, to her credit, because she's a very, very nice lady, uh, dubbed it for us. <laughs> she held the iPad. And awesome. Said, <laughs> and then, and then she looks up and goes, "That was terrible." Yeah. <laughs> well, fun. I know we had some other um, uh, images from set, and also the Stan Winston people who couldn't end up being here for the panel today sent us some uh, images. So I was wondering um, if you could tell us a little bit more about some of those. Perhaps if you know anything more about the like models and, and stuff like that that they do on their end. I mean, I know you know at least a little bit about like maquettes. Yeah, clearly this is a, 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 it's similar to the spaceship maquette that we start with. We often start with um, sculptures of characters, especially uh, creatures and things like that, that can then be either uh, 3D scanned or just created in the computer. Yeah, and that was, that was an actual costume. That actually one of my favorite things about the movie is there, there were the CG uh, creatures where the action needed to be really mobile and, and uh, fluid. But for some of the more um, simple creatures, 
not, not I, I, that's the wrong way to say it. This is not a simple creature. But more simple than something that has a run across a planet. They used actual costumes. Ceres was a costume that I thought was always really oh, yeah. brilliant with the fold-out wings and things like that. Yeah. And the when Ceres you, costume it actually incorporates what they were going to do for Planet of the Apes when Stan Winston was going to do the James Cameron version of Planet of the Apes. Oh, wow. So that apparatus, that, that was what they developed for that, for the, the ape mouths, for that, oh, that version. So Right, yeah, this is a still from a super creepy, actually, video of, I think, <laughs> the actors are trying it out in just a random parking lot or yeah. something like that. But yeah, the fact that like when the actor articulates the whole mask articulates. Yeah, yeah. Um, and he's just sort of like saying threatening things. It's like, oh, that's really If you pause crazy. it in the right place, you can <laughs> yeah. see the entire actor's mouth inside the mask. Uh, right. He's got like a weird like apparatus like uh, glued to his mouth and everything. Yeah. Those, but the octopi, uh, that was actually a collaboration because as you were saying, it's a suit. That thing is so big and heavy, they can't move. They just <laughs> stay in place. So when you see it slide up in that one scene, that's ILM making Winston's suit move in the frame. So, FYI. Yeah, and the way they do these, they, they sculpt them out of clay in full size. And then they make molds and they cast them out of the materials, either the, the latexes or the urethanes that they use for uh, the creatures themselves. Yeah, that's what I noticed about this picture. There's like a small one and then a big one and then even maybe like a paper cutout or something like that. Yeah, so we do the we do the maquettes to work out what the design is going to be like. The cardboard cutouts we work, we'll print a number of different sizes of cutouts um, to figure out what size it needs to be. We'll have people stand next to it and take pictures and stuff. Once we figure out what size it is, then then we could start on the, the full And the blue creature. babies the, that you showed before, the miners, um, that came out of a Bernie Wrightson design. So, I mean, here we are at Comic-Con. I, should, I just heard five people go, miners, not miners. <laughs> <laughs> right crowd, right yeah, crowd. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Bernie Wrightson, one of the great comic book artists, and, and did the illustrations for that amazing illustrated Frankenstein and you know all, all this stuff. He was just he, Swamp Thing. The list goes on and on and on. And he, he did a lot of designs that then Crash McCreary, uh, he did a lot of revising of those designs or some of his own designs. And those little blue babies, that comes directly from a Bernie Wrightson design. And also there's a, there's a rock monster with, that's like a very Wrightson illustration that I... Rock. Yep, yep, <laughs> yeah. yep. <laughs> he, he. Yeah, well, even though we don't have them here, I uh, kept this uh, that in, too, because I was just shocked to find out that maybe Dr. Lazarus would have had, you know, yep. tentacle hair... Um, and I can see now why they decided to keep it a little bit more simple. They ran into the same issue that, that you guys had, fun with the, uh, um, they wanted it to look like cheesy, syndicated 80s TV show. They wanted it to look like um, Buck Rogers when, mm. when they were doing Buck Rogers in the 80s. So they had to figure out, like, okay, how do we do what we do bad? So they put, <laughs> they put a seam in it. Like, if you look at the headpiece, there's, like, a big seam, and the color is not quite right, and it's too thick and there are little pores in it and everything and you watch the movie and it still looks great they can't help themselves well and when you were talking about like visual effects versus practical effects the like pig lizard I have to say is one of my favorite insights from the documentary is the like designer who like offered to come to set and then seems like it's maybe the biggest regret of his life that's Shane Mahan who to this day is like one of the head guys at legacy effects which is what Stan Winston turned into and they call it legacy because it's Stan Winston's legacy but he and uh, John Rosengrant and, and um, a bunch of the former Winston guys run Legacy Effects. So he does a lot of the Marvel movies. And Charles Newworth, who worked on Galaxy Quest, also does a lot of Marvel movies. And so he'll be sitting in his office, and an assistant will say, uh, we have a call coming in for Pig Lizard. And Shane's like, I know who it is. Okay, put him through. Yeah. Because Charles calls Shane Pig Lizard to this day. When Bob wrote it, he was imagining, like, we get a real piglet and put like a fin on it, huh. yeah. or or we get like a Komodo dragon, you know, kind of a monitor lizard, and we and we put like a pig nose on him, something like that. And then Crash started with the rock because what he was thinking was it it's going to be confused with the rock monster, mm -hmm. so he made that's why it's so sort of round like that with these stubby legs, and so he draws it like that, and they're like, well, you got to get the pig aspect, and it starts to blow out, and at some point Shane points at it and says. Yeah, I bet it could fit in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to Goblin Valley, Utah. Oh, right. In the most extraordinary heat he's ever experienced, and Shane is stuck in that thing. Yeah. 
And Tim Allen, uh, not exactly a method actor, but he's whipping rocks at it. He's doing all this stuff. <laughs> at one point, the monitor breaks, and Shane says he just hears Stan going, you're going the wrong way. He's like, I'm sure I am, because I can't see anything. It's <laughs> like, what, you can't see anything? He's like, yeah. He's like, I will right, we'll try to go the right way then. And it's like, <laughs> literally, he gets bolted into that thing at the beginning of the day, and then, you know, like a baby calf being born at the end of the day, <laughs> they open him, and this sweaty guy just spills out. Oh so, yeah, I'm sure he regrets it, but also, it's the pig lizard. He is immortal. Yeah. Well, it is the reason it holds up, because that was a practical suit, yeah. right? Yeah. So. <laughs> That's, they had so much fun making that movie and a, bi a big part of it was um, nobody was watching them Nobody was, they were all, everybody from DreamWorks was in Malta because Gladiator was being produced at the same time and Oliver Reed died during the making of Gladiator and that was a big huge movie and you know, Ridley Scott and Russell Crowe all eyes were over there and so they kind of got away with Galaxy Quest <laughs> and going back to those octopi, there was a call, a zero-hour call, that um, Spielberg thinks maybe the, the octopi aliens should be like gray men, like from Close Encounters. Mm -hmm. And this is after those giant octopi are complete. Right. <laughs> you know, but it's like when you get, it's, we, we shoot in a week. We can't, no, we worked on that thing for six months. We can, they're done. That's what Shane said. But they're done. <laughs> and because of that, if it had been digital, they would have been gray men because it's Spielberg, what he says goes. Wow. But because they were using practical effects and those things are so incredibly hard to make, start to finish, okay, well, fine, we'll just go with the octopi. Can you imagine Galaxy Quest without that scene where they're all on the deck and the doors open? They come and... Would have been a different, um, a different movie. get to go to set? Uh, no, no. no. They had already finished shooting by the time we started. It, so. oh, okay. Okay. Has anyone been to Goblin Valley? Done the pilgrimage? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's weird, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> it is the set. It's very... It's so weird. It, and it's weird like, rock formations. It yeah. looks like another planet. Yeah. And it is a valley, so you drive up to it, and you can't even see it until you're literally there, and then it falls in, and it's, it is it is the set. It's so... Yeah, don't <laughs> bring your own beryllium sphere. Don't you know, attack any rocks or anything like that. So. Well, since we are uh, good on time, Aaron, I want to make sure I am a big uh, on the, whether or not the science checks out. So uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your Star Trek character and background, and tell us a little bit about this black hole that we see in Galaxy Quest. Thank you. So, all right, let's do it. Let's science Galaxy Quest. <laughs> uh, so for those of you who don't know, the image up there is an image from me in season two of Star Trek Prodigy, where I get to teach Temporal Mechanics 101 to the students, which is a dream come true. So I am a professor at Starfleet Academy, which is great. Um, but what's cool, so what I like about this is all science fiction has to sort of confront how we're going to travel right because space is very very big and you can't you know you go on a five-year mission even at the speed of light you're only going to make it to the nearest star and you're not even going to make it back and so various science fiction comes up with different things you know obviously with this being a wreck on star trek they don't necessarily call out like a warp drive necessarily but we see it do some version of like the star trek warping that we see and the idea behind that is if you take our um sheet of space time and you cannot go faster than the speed of light on that surface of our universe. So a lot of people have seen the bowling ball and the trampoline analogy, right? You have a planet or a star, it's going to dip it down. If you're traveling, it takes a lot of effort to move. The lighter you are, the faster you're able to move. And eventually, if you have no mass, like a light particle, you just coast in a straight line. But that's your speed limit. And so the idea behind warp drive is that you build a bubble of space-time around your ship because the fabric itself, nothing says that can't travel faster than the speed of light. So that's a little tangent primer on warp drive and we can assume that the nsea protector has something similar from what we've seen but we also see these black hole effects in the film <laughs> and black holes are geometrically very basically identical to wormholes it's just wormholes connect two points in that fabric of space-time whereas a black hole is just a collapsed star 
but the the geometric sort of shape of it in our universe is about the same. And seriously, like when, uh, so it's connecting two points that otherwise you'd have to travel on the surface for. Some of you may have seen like the Carl Sagan, like, you know, punch a hole through the paper and that's your wormhole. Fold the paper. And, fold yeah. the paper and stick a pencil through. Yeah. Thank you for the science demonstration. <laughs> and so when they, when they go through like this, what looks like a black hole, it's really a wormhole and it's connecting two points that are actually getting them closer to our solar system. Um, but one cool thing is when an object falls into a black hole, it goes through a process that is the scientifically technical term of spaghettification. <laughs> and because uh, you basically get stretched out. The gravity differentials from your feet to your head are so different that it's going to stretch you out. And I swear to God, Galaxy Quest is the best visual of spaghettification I've seen in any science fiction as it's going, as it's popping out of that black hole and all of the gravity that, you know, we assume it's compensating for in some, some respect whatsoever. It's fine. Uh, for that. It's fine, yeah, but like the visual of the spaghettification, I use this all all the time in my science lectures of like, this is what it would look like. So yes, the 10, what, 10 points for that. Would Stephen Hawking say it would be a spectacular way to die? Spectacular <laughs> way to go, yeah, yeah. exactly. Like <laughs> um, uh, and I know, uh, it, it, since we have a little time, talk about the Omega 13. I don't know if you have any <laughs> thoughts astrophysically <laughs> about how that might work. I assume this was a Visual effect, Vaughn, or did you guys get to do anything with the Omega 13? Oh, that was all CG. That was all CG. Okay, yeah. that's, that's yeah. kind of what I got the, the visually. Um, but I'm curious if anyone's got any thoughts about how this might work. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, again, so our fabric of our universe is a four-dimensional space and time. So you go three dimensions in space, right? You go forward, back, left, right, up, down, and we go forward in time at one second per second. We just don't have any control over the time variable, but our universe is this four-dimensional fabric. And so the idea behind like something like the omega-13 particle is that it is able to bend space-time in such a way that it almost... And they show a pretty good visual of it when they activate it, of it kind of warping space time. And it really is just like, and we're going to put you back here in the time dimension, but all of your spatial dimensions stay the same. I like to think that, I mean, I don't know any of the official story, but being a Voyager fan, they brought up the Omega particle, right? It was like this big, scary thing that would destroy all of, you know, rend space time useless. And so I like to think they're the same thing and it's all the same universe, but... That's just have you break. slipped any Galaxy Quest stuff into Star Trek? Uh, oh, have or, I? I, don't, uh. <laughs> I, I just have to say, I watch all these horror movies and they don't even scare me anymore, but everything you're talking about is why sci-fi gives me anxiety attacks. <laughs> <laughs> just what you said about space in this direction. Right. I'm just like... Oh. <laughs> it's okay. It's why, I, it's why I'm here. <laughs> I got you. Thank God you're here. <laughs> Someone understands Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, um, Fawn, I'm curious, in all of your dozens and dozens of movies you worked on at ILM, this one keeps coming up, but I'm like, what should we do for Comic-Con? It's like, when can we talk about Galaxy Quest? <laughs> so, like, what is about this movie that really, like, stays with you all these years later? I, there's a timelessness to this movie. There's, there's a few movies uh, that I feel like you could just watch again and again. Or, I guess I call them my, there's, there's like, the best movies, my favorite movies, and then there's favorite rewatchers. This is definitely a favorite rewatcher. Like, when you see Matrix, you can only see it one time for it to have the impact that it has. Mm. That's a really good movie. It's one of my favorite movies. But Galaxy Quest has that impact every time you watch it, you know, so that's a rewatcher. Um, and this definitely, like, the visual effects hold up. Uh, it was a really fun thing to work on. It wasn't taken that seriously when we were doing it. In fact, we usually kind of have our little wagers and stuff while we're working on movies, and we try to decide which movie we're working on is going to be a stinker, <laughs> which one's going to be good, you know. <laughs> Fortunately, most of them have been pretty good. <laughs> but this one we thought was not going to be great, <laughs> to be totally honest. Because it was just so loose and it kept changing. And what we didn't know is it was all building up to something really perfect, you know. And then we were also working on Pearl Harbor kind of close to this. And we thought that was going to be the incredible movie that was like Torah, 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 historical, all that kind of stuff. And we all know how that turned out. <laughs> Fun. Did you work with Bill George directly? Was oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, he was a visual George. effects supervisor on the movie. I just saw him last week. We did right. an ILM reunion. Oh. It's pretty Great fun. Guy. Nice. Yeah. 
Well, Aaron and uh, Jack, I'm curious about your sort of thoughts about it, and uh, from the fan perspective, of, you know what? <laughs> what Harold right Sam to yeah. spend three and a half years of your life. Uh, you said doing this document. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've seen a lot of cosplay that takes commitment, but rolling yeah. a beryllium spear around a con all day. Well, um, that yeah. I mean, that's the thing. That's how we found them. We we were at we were just shooting B-roll at a Silicon Valley Comic Con, and it was just one of those things of. <laughs> Oh, I wish that there were cosplayers here who were doing Galaxy Quest characters. And at one of the producers, uh, this was in post-production. We were trying to find a good bookend for the movie. So it wasn't just, oh, it's a bunch of talking heads talking about the making of Galaxy Quest. So we go and we decide to um, just talk to people and man on the street kind of thing. Like, have you seen Galaxy Quest? What do you think of Galaxy Quest? All that kind of stuff. And what's funny is that it was it felt like such an underdog. Because you had all these Marvel people. Marvel was king at that point, certainly. You had all these people dressed as Deadpool. You had all these people dressed as Halo characters and you know, Star Wars characters, all that stuff. And it's like, my producer says, I just wish that there were... And I'm like, I know, I know. I wish that they were here too. And she just kept checking the hashtags on Instagram. And finally, she's like, there are Thermians here. <laughs> I look at her and I'm like, what, like now? <laughs> And she says, they just posted like five minutes ago. They're here. They're here now. <laughs> and then it becomes, okay, you go to this place. You go to the, like, you cover this quadrant. You qu- cover this quadrant. And totally went to Terminator mode of like, okay, I'm going down every row and just snaking along, looking for the cosplayers who look like Thermians. And then I finally, I found them <laughs> standing there talking to somebody, and they would not break character. I love <laughs> Just... Standing there like, oh, and I walk so up and say, good. "Hi, I'm Jack. I'm directing a documentary about Galaxy Quest." And they're like, hmm? <laughs> "Historical documentary." Well, that's what it was. I was like, "I want to interview you," and they're like, hmm? <laughs> and "I said, um, I'm uh," and one of them goes, "Historical documents." I'm like, "Yes, yes, I'm making a historical document." <laughs> and. And I had set up my uh, my camera guys to be in the lobby outside this one specific door. And I'm like, follow me. And they're like, ooh. <laughs> it's, it's so extraordinary because I'm having the experience of the characters in Galaxy Quest <laughs> meeting the Thermians at the convention. And that's what they wanted. This is yeah. why I found out later. They wanted people to have that experience. They wanted people who knew that movie to have the experience of meeting some Thermians. <laughs> so I burst through the doors, and I run over to my guys, Justin and Dan, who I've worked with for years, and they're, they're used to this stuff. And I'm like, okay, in 30 seconds, two Thermians are going to walk through that door and, and just, like, film them, like, in the crowd and then, like, find them. <laughs> and Dan and Justin are like, okay, yeah. And you see it in the movie, this crashed Zoom, where it's, like, Marvel characters, Star Wars characters, all these characters, and then, boom, and we find these two lone Thermians. <laughs> and they walk up to the camera, and then I interview them in character, and they won't break character. And right at the end, one hands me a business card. <laughs> and, I, and it says, Thermians from Utah. <laughs> <laughs> so I call the number maybe like an hour later, and I just hear this voice say, Hey, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Harold. I, I was the guy you were talking. I'm the Thermian. <laughs> and that was like the first moment I actually heard his voice. And Harold and Roxanne are this lovely couple who have been going to all kinds of Comic Cons and they, all. They kind- come to a ton of Star Trek conventions. Ton yeah. of Star I've Trek met conventions. Them before, yeah. And their job <laughs> in their minds is just to bring to represent Galaxy Quest to be those characters. And so the next day they showed up as Doctor Lazarus and and Tawny in the rolling the Brilliant Sphere. And they, people say, like, never give up. And they go, oh, shut up. Like, they do the whole thing. <laughs> and that's how we found them. And that's, that's directly from the doc, us, us filming them. Yeah. Yeah. And that became the bookend of the movie. We found them. And yeah. the beginning is Galaxy Quest is this underdog. You know, it, and Hollywood doesn't know it's everybody's favorite movie. <laughs> and then we book a screening at the end and invite them there. And Harold and Roxanne meet Missy Pyle and mm-hmm. Rico Colantoni, the people that they're playing, <laughs> and that's the end of the movie. It's that's like so you take the fans, and that's the other thing too. Um, uh, that screening sold out in record time. It was like a, it was a fathom event, and I, I think it, it sold out in uh, three minutes. People <laughs> buying tickets who clearly own the movie at home already, <laughs> <laughs> and just wanted to show up to see it with a bunch of with a bunch of fans. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. That's yeah. that's the ending. 
And uh, Harold goes, he's my hero. And that's the, <laughs> the end of the movie. We'll have a few minutes for audience questions, but I want to pitch. And then Fawn has a booth downstairs uh, nice. you want to talk about in the class. Oh, yeah, room 526. Uh, we have a booth. We have some of our um, miniatures on display. So you could take your a picture of yourself in a miniature city as a kaiju. Oh, I did that. <laughs> and then we have this container ship and octopus that we built with the Stan Winston School for a lesson that's coming out in uh, chapters. Uh, it started about two months ago, and it'll go all the way into February of next year. Uh, but it goes into how to build an animatronic octopus and a container ship for it to attack. Awesome. Use, and it's a focus on uh, technology-driven fabrication. Yeah. All right. Do we have any audience questions? Yes. Yeah. And I think, too, so the comment was just about how well it portrays this sort of tribe and this family you feel and how, like, Star Trek especially, I think, is so real to a lot of people. When I give talks, I always try to, like, I never like saying, well, in the real world versus the Star Trek world, because the Star Trek world is real to a lot of us. And, like, genuinely, like, another favorite moment from Galaxy Quest that honestly gives me chills every time is when Jason Nesbitt calls, you know, the the nerdy kid and is like, uh, and he's like, I know it's not real. Like, I'm sorry I got weird about it. Like, I know it's not real. He's like, stop, 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 stop. It's all real. Oh, my God, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Like, and that's that's just, Justin Long in his first movie. It's Absolutely so good. And, performance. and so I always like to say it's like pre Cochrane and post Cochrane. It's yeah. like before the Vulcans came and visited. But and, like it is because it is real to a lot of us. And I think Galaxy Quest makes us feel that way. And did you feel val- validated watching the movie? Did you feel like, oh, I feel seen? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, Jack, wasn't that the original, wasn't that the original the, title of your documentary, too? The it was. Real? It was the working title was yeah. It's All Real. <laughs> yeah. and, that's, and that's what we had as the crash to the title was Harold saying, stop, it's all real. And we had this beautiful graphic and everything. Like, it's one of those things where when I, when I think about all the stuff that we're talking about and how ahead of its time it was, like, they make the very cogent point that if that movie had come out ten years later, it would have cleaned up at the box office it would have been you know on the forefront of something instead it was just a little too early but it's the maybe first indication i can think of of validating the nerds for their nerdiness Mm -hmm. saying listen this is be passionate about what you're passionate about don't be ashamed and there's no such thing as a guilty pleasure and i always say this of like that ending when he bows to the fans Mm -hmm. It's like that. That's that's as good as you know the Lord of the Rings, where it's like my friends who bow to no one. It's like I like it better in Galaxy Quest. Oh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> that's yeah. so good. Any other questions? Oh yeah. The fascinating thing is the fact they put a lot of fan complaints uh, about Star Trek. And the one I enjoy the most is the one we ever talked about a half of the Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's stupid. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah. Well, and too, like for me, it just brought back a memory of like. So I, like I said, I wasn't into the Star Trek fandom when it came out, but I was very much into X Files fandom. <laughs> and the moment when uh, Jason, when they they kiss at the convention on the end, and the girl passes out, yes. I was like, <laughs> if Jillian Anderson and David Duchovny did that at a convention, I would be on the floor. Like I would a thousand. They were like my one. One true pairing like that is, yeah. And so, I, yeah, I agree. Well, it's I just, agree. Yeah. For anyone who hasn't seen Jack's documentary, Sigourney Weaver's interview is probably my favorite part of that because she is so game. She knows exactly what she was doing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Seems to really, really love that role. So if you really just think of her as like Ripley or something like that. That, that was the one I was the most intimidated by just mm-hmm. by virtue of, you know, how many... If I have to go home and look at all of my Sigourney Weaver movies and the Alien box set and throw them out because I... Yeah. <laughs> like that was the one that was the most pressure on me just because I was the biggest fan and oh god she is the sweetest nicest <laughs> lady just seems like a nice lady from the neighborhood and uh, and then I got halfway through the interview the publicist walks in and says uh, Miss Weaver we have to and she goes no it's okay <laughs> I was like yes I got the wave off <laughs> So nice. we went from a 20-minute interview to an hour-long interview. Nice. By the way, Chill Mitchell told me that's that moment when she says, I have one job. It's stupid. <laughs> he said, try being on the other end of that. It's a hilarious <laughs> scene. And then Ripley is going, look, and pointing <laughs> at you. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're going to wrap up here so that the other panel can take place. But um, uh, the panelists at their game will be out in the hallway answering all the last few questions and stuff like that. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank Woo! you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Never give up. Never surrender. (laughs) 
Thanks so much for listening to this bonus episode of Star Wars Ologies. We hope you enjoyed all of our LA Comic Con panels. Thanks to all of you who came out in person to see us. Keep an eye out for a new episode of Star Wars Ologies coming soon.